Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Henry Schein Infection Control Awareness Webinar. My name is Carson Carpenter. I'll be your host for this presentation. Just a little bit about myself. Um, I am a practicing dentist. I'm also president of Compliance Training Partners, and I've been involved in compliance issues like OSHA, HIPAA, and infection control for over 25 years. Now, infection control, it's always been evolving. Um, I've been course, involved with it for a long time, and I've seen that. But it's been evolving even faster during this COVID period. Uh, and now we've got a few challenges, right? We have the Delta variant. We thought we were out of the woods, but we're not. So really what this webinar is designed to do, is designed to allow you to up your game to use current best practices uh, to protect not only yourself and your staff, but your patients and also to protect your business, because that's a real concern, right? A breach in infection control um, can be a real concern in a practice today. Um, I will tell you that we've done a lot of things right in dentistry. Statistics show that about, depending on where you read, about 9% of the general population has contracted COVID. About 25% of physicians and nurses contracted COVID, yet only 2.6% of dentists have contracted COVID over the last year and a half. So obviously our PPE is working, we're doing things right, um, but still we always need to improve our game. We need to up our game all the time. Our patients expect that, our staff expects that. So our first topic is one that, that I think is really important. Um, and, and ever changing and evolving, and that's waterline safety. And tonight we're going to have Andrea Carpenter present a segment, the first segment, on waterline safety. And she's going to talk about how we can not only comply, but, but how some tips and tricks on, on, on how to have safe, clean dental unit water lines. Uh, Andrea's background, she is the Director of Professional Education for compliance training partners. And she has been involved in ocean infection control for over five years. She's guided a number of practices through ocean inspections, and infection control breaches. And I think you're gonna enjoy her presentation. With that, Andrea, if you could please begin your part of the webinar. Thank you for joining me today and talking about waterline cleaning and maintenance. My name is Andrea from Compliance Training Partners, and we're gonna spend a few minutes here talking about how to make sure that our bacterial level counts are low in our water units. So let's start by talking about why it's important to make sure that our bacteria levels in our dental unit water is low. And the first thing I wanna talk about is the CDC. The CDC states that dental unit water needs to have less than 500 colony forming units or CFUs of heterotrophic bacteria per milliliter of water. So what this really means is that the water that comes out of our dental units and into our patient's mouth when we provide treatment for them needs to be considered safe drinking water. Now the bad news for us is that dental unit is ideal for growth. It contains a lot of small diameter tubing that biofilm just love to grow in. Um, so if we don't treat our water properly and we don't follow good protocol, our bacteria levels are going to skyrocket. We've also seen major lawsuits filed by patients against dentists with high levels of bacteria in the water lines. And this is because after they've received treatment, patients have actually gotten really sick from the water that's in their mouth as they're being treated. So we're going to want to make sure that we avoid this from happening in your facility. And we're talk, going to talk about some protocols and ways to maintain your water so we can avoid this. So one of the primary sources of bacteria that we found that goes into our water lines is the municipal water supply. So the source water, the water that goes into our lines, which is why we are huge fans of self-contained water systems. Uh, with these self-contained water systems, you're able to select the quality of water that you use, so the water that goes in. But remember, biofilm love to grow in the small diameter tubing, so it's not enough just to add clean water. We also need to make sure that we maintain the water in our systems, which is why the self-contained water systems allow us to use cleaners, disinfectants, and even shock treatments within our water lines. 
What's great about these self-contained water systems as well is that we are able to practice during boil water notices. I know just within the last year in the facility I'm in, we had boil water notice twice, and it was great that we could still see patients, treat them, and make sure that the water that we were using on them was safe. Now, I'm going to go over a protocol to follow. This is what we recommend most of our clients do, and this is a protocol that we follow in the facility I'm in as well. And we found that if we follow these steps, bacterial levels and counts always result to be low. So uh, we're going to talk about shocking our systems at least quarterly, using a waterline cleaner on a weekly basis, or using a full-time low-level disinfectant, purging our water lines and letting them dry, talking about discharging water lines between patients, and very important, we're going to talk about water uh, testing of our units. So let's start out talking about shocking the system. When I say shocking the system, what this really means is giving one big deep cleaning to our water units. What we wanna do is we wanna create a sodium hypochlorite or bleach solution. Depending on what bleach you have, if you have a 5.25% to 6.25%, you wanna do a one to nine ratio dilution with water. If you have a higher concentration bleach, such as a seven to 8.25%, you're gonna wanna do the ratio one to 13 dilution with water. So you're gonna make the dilution, put it in those self-contained water bottles, and then you're going to run the site sodium hypochlorite or bleach into the lines. We wanna to remember to get all the lines. So this is gonna include our air water syringe, our high speed lines, and our ultrasonic scalers. We're gonna run that solution for 10 minutes. And afterwards, we're gonna flush the lines out. So we're gonna add water, we're gonna dump out the sodium hypochlorite or bleach, we're gonna add water to our bottles and flush out the bleach. We don't want our patients to have a bleach solution going in um, while we're doing treatment on them. So when we shock the system, we wanna make sure that we're doing this at least on a quarterly basis. Depending on your facility, you might need to do it more often. Um, and the way you're really gonna know how often shocking the system needs to be done is depending on the results of the water test that you conduct. So if you have high levels of bacteria, even after you're shocking quarterly, you might need to start shocking on a monthly basis. We have some facilities that shock on a monthly or even weekly basis to make sure that the levels uh, remain low. Now, besides shocking the system, something else we wanna incorporate is waterline cleaners. And these are weekly waterline cleaners or again, a full-time low-level disinfectant. These water cleaners are not going to decrease the bacterial count in our water lines, but they're gonna keep them low. They're gonna keep them consistent. So between shocking the system and using the water line cleaners, we're gonna do a really good job in making sure that these levels remain low. As far as cleaners or low level disinfectants, there's lots of them out there. Um, you know, you could use tablets, you can use straws or li liquid cleaners. Um, they're all very effective. Desiccation or drying out the lines is a very effective method of decreasing bacteria. Remember that moist environment that biofilm love to grow in. If we take that environment away, it's going to decrease the bacterial count. So we recommend that when you leave their office for the weekend, purge all the water lines, leave them dry over the weekend. And discharging water between patients. It's also shown that some of the bacteria that we have or that we find in our lines is actually retracted oral fluids. So by discharging water lines for 20 seconds between patients, we're flushing out that retracted oral fluid and hopefully avoiding um, bacteria to go from one patient to another. Now, regardless of what protocol you take, if you decide to take our protocol and making sure that we keep those bacterial levels count, we still wanna make sure that we don't miss a very important uh, step. And that is to make sure that we're testing our water lines consistently. It's been shown that 31% of water lines that are tested fail. So that means that 31% have a bacterial count that's over those 500 CFUs that CDC says we need to be under. And 61% of practices have at least one operatory that fails a test when they're tested. Um, so regardless of, again, what protocol you use, there's no way that you're going to know what your bacterial level of, or count is unless you actually test it. 
Now the EPA, OSAP, and dental unit manufacturers all recommend testing on a quarterly basis. So we wanna make sure that we test each operatory. If you see the image below, you can see that there's four different tests or four different paddles, each with a number underneath it corresponding to their operatory. And you can see that each test looks different. And this does happen often where you could be using operatories the same amount of time, be cleaning and maintaining them the same, yet for some reason, some operatories may grow more bacteria than others. Um, before, we've had clients that like to you know, test some operatories one quarter and the rest another, but we want to make sure that we're not doing that. Um, we want to see what the bacteria levels are in each operatory. So please make sure you're testing them quarterly. In office, testing is very cost effective. It's something that we recommend. Um, and these records, so these testing that you do need to be maintained for three years. Um, one easy and great way to maintain these records is to put them side by side like you see here and snap a quick picture of it and keep those pictures. That could be your documentation for waterline testing. Now, I wish I had more time with you to talk about water testing and waterline cleaning, um, but if you do have any questions, please feel free to give us a call. I have our phone number here. Um, also, I've written down our website so you can go online go online, see some of our resources, um, have some questions answered on water testing, maintenance or cleaning. Um, and thank you all for having me. Thank you, Henry Shine, for allowing me the time to come and talk about waterline cleaning and maintenance. Andrea, that was a really good presentation. Uh, and thank you for helping us to better understand dental unit waterline safety. It was a good overview. This is an area that all practices need to focus on Again, to protect not only their patients, but the liability of their businesses, as you so correctly pointed out. Well, for the next part of our infection control webinar, I'd like to introduce Nancy Dewhurst, who's a registered dental hygienist. She's an infection control specialist, and she's a member of the adjunct faculty at West Coast University. And what she's going to talk about is something that's really important, that is barriers, chemical surface disinfection, and something that's fairly new, that's ultraviolet germicidal disinfection. Uh, Nancy, uh, we're pleased to have you here tonight. Um, please go ahead and begin. Welcome to Dental Office Surface Asepsis. I'm Nancy Dewhurst, and I'm a, an infection control specialist and adjunct faculty at West Coast University. So today, we're going to briefly discuss barriers, chemical surface disinfection, and ultraviolet germicidal irradiation. So the important thing first is to simplify your surfaces so that when you don your utility gloves and you have your face protection in place and you're ready to go, you can actually find the surfaces you're supposed to be cleaning. This may involve removing clutter because clutter happens. So the most important thing now is to get down to the surfaces, be able to do what you need to do. And then you have a couple of choices, probably cover it with a barrier or clean it and disinfect it with a chemical, right? Those are still our two choices after all these years. So if you're going to use a barrier, use an FDA cleared medical grade barrier. Now more than any other time, it's very important to know that the barrier you chose has been tested for viral and bacterial penetration. And that's only going to happen with FDA cleared medical barriers. If you're still using dry cleaner bags or food wrap, you just don't know that you're safe. So where do we put the barriers? We put them on the hardest to clean surfaces, right? That's usually what, uh, what drives the decision so that we can save time. Uh, some other surfaces that really benefit by the use of barriers are upholstery because they can absorb chemicals and be damaged by chemicals and certainly electronics because they can be damaged. Any complex surface like the keyboards for sure. Hopefully everybody's changing these per patient. And then there are some other areas, actually a weak link in dentistry are digital sensors. We rely on barriers to cover them because we can't sterilize them or use them once and throw them away. So 
it, we're trying to do something very, very important with the barriers. So use the right ones. And of course, clean and disinfect the digital sensors between each use using an intermediate level disinfectant. So you do both the chemicals and the plastic. What about other surfaces? If you have a light handle like the one you see on the left, do you really need to clean it with a disinfectant as well as use a barrier? And the answer is, it depends on if it's compromised, if the surface underneath got dirty, it's, it's us up to us to decide. How about if you have an air water syringe, like the one in the middle, there's a hole in the end of that barrier. So of course, when you take the barrier off, you clean it and disinfect it with a chemical as well. So these kinds of discussions are important to have in your office, and it's important to observe whether people are taking shortcuts and not using these things correctly. Product selection and strategies. It's important and best practices to use an EPA intermediate level disinfectant in your operatories and for all high touch surfaces. There is a list, an EPA list of surface disinfectants that are effective against SARS-CoV-2 and the website is listed here on the slide for you. Most of us since COVID-19 have extended the area that we're responsible for and the frequency of our surface disinfection. All touch and transfer surfaces are fair game for cleaning and disinfecting. We're basically doing more work and we're meeting a higher standard. Some disinfectant companies will recommend a weekly deep cleaning with soap and water to remove all the built up chemicals and possibly dry biofilms that could have been missed during the week. So check with your manufacturer. Cleaning is essential. It's the essential first step of disinfection. Disinfection will fail on unclean surfaces. So here's the question. Are you cleaning before disinfecting? And that depends on your technique, on your product selection. So we all know the mantra of spray, wipe, spray. The spraying and wiping is that essential cleaning step. The disinfection happens when you apply the disinfectant and leave it. So the chemicals can kill anything that wasn't cleaned off. And the same thing with wipes, wipe, discard, that was the cleaning step. Wipe again with a new wipe, not the old wipe, and that's your disinfection. So what if you buy a product that says single step cleaner disinfectant? Well, on a visibly clean surface, this is a product with a formulation that can both clean and disinfect. But if it's not a visibly clean surface, you need to do the two steps and always leave it for the stated time. And you can find that on the label. So that's going to be different for different products. And it's important to know uh, what level of product you have. Number one, you're not sterilizing anything on a surface. That For that, you have to put the item in the sterilizer. So you're not killing spores. If a spore is on the surface, your only hope is to clean it up. So that's why that cleaning step remains important. For chemical disinfection, there are two main levels of products that we use in dentistry. Intermediate level disinfectants have the capability of destroying harder to kill organisms. So they'll have a TB kill time on the label. That's important. So if you use a product that has a TB kill time, it's an intermediate level disinfectant, and it's effective against all the things you see written in black here, as well as all the things you see written in blue. So it's a bigger range of organisms. It's more effective as a product. If you buy a low level hospital disinfectant, it still kills all the things that are blue on this list, but it misses that important range of things that are written in black, the fungi the small viruses, enteroviruses, things that you're still responsible for. If you buy an intermediate level disinfectant and you use it correctly, what you've essentially got is a large margin of safety because now there's a full range of or organisms that the chemical works against. And of course that depends on your technique. 
So know your products, know what the active ingredient is in your product. On this slide, we've got uh, phenols, we've got uh, quaternary ammonium alcohols, we've got a hydrogen peroxide product, and every, sometimes we have products that have different mixtures in them. And sometimes you'll have a product that has a manufacturer's label on it, and another product that have the same manufacturer's label, but they're entirely different uh, chemical ingredients, and they shouldn't be used together. So it's important, again, to read those labels and use harmonious products together. Not all products clean the same. So how do you know? A product with more water, less alcohol is basically going to dissolve proteins more easily and clean things more easily. A product with higher alcohol is, even has a chance of fixing proteins to surface depending on the product. So with those high alcohol products, it's even more important that the cleaning step is complete. In one office, if you have way too many products, you could be dangerously com combining chemicals. You need to take a look at how many products you have in your office. And this is where maybe your, your dealer rep can help you. They can find a product that works well for you, that uh, allows you to distill down the choices down to one or two products. And that makes your life a little safer. If you're still making wipes, and some people do make wipes with a, adding a solution to it, what's the problem with that? Only that it may not be uh, viable for a long period of time. We know that when you buy wipes in a tub, lots of testing has happened to make sure that the wipe is compatible over time with the chemistry of the disinfectant. If you make your own, you introduce variables that in fact could degrade the chemistry of the surface disinfectant over time. So if you make your own wipes, use them up right away. Now, the last thing is, is kind of newer, and some of us may have heard of it as we've discussed aerosol management uh, because of COVID-19. Uh, ultraviolet germicidal irradiation, targets both air and surfaces. So some people are considering this technology for surface disinfection. It's directional, so it's not gonna be active where the shadows are. You must vacate the room at higher doses, and the efficacy does require specific dosage, airflow, and time. The lights degrade over time, so it does have to be, the technology has to be kept up. And upper room UVGI, is used in medical isolation rooms. It's highly recommended for management of aerosols. It depends, this technology depends on the movement of the air up into the range of the zone of effectiveness of the unit, which is typically way above where the humans are. So it cleans air, that's the difference. If you're thinking of cleaning surfaces with UV, that's a different prospect. So thank you for joining me for this quick overview of dental office surface asepsis. Well, Nancy, I'd like to thank you. That was an excellent review of infection control. I was particularly interested in the upper room UVGI. That, that's something that's really new to dentistry. Um, and I, I think it's a concept that, that's particularly interesting and has great potential. So, so thank you again for that great presentation. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. David Resnick. Dr. Resnick is an infectious disease expert, and he's the director of the Oral Health Center for Grady Health Systems. And Dr. Resnick is going to present something that I think is so important, something that, that many of us uh, need to review, and that's proper donning and doffing of personal protective equipment. Now, donning and doffing, it's always been important. In other words, the order that we put on our mask, gloves, glasses, protective clothing, is it can really prevent the transmission of disease. But during this COVID pandemic period, it's even more important. So with that, Dr. Resnick, if you could begin, I'm looking forward to reviewing this again myself. Today, we have a special treat. We have Dr. Kay Benz, who is gonna go over donning and doffing PPE 
which is very important during this pandemic and we need to be able to do it properly. And I can't think of anybody better to show you than Dr. Benz. So the first thing that Dr. Benz is going to do is, is, is hand sanitizing. So we recommend using an alcohol-based rub for 15 to 20 seconds, making sure you get all the areas of your hand. Hand hygiene is one of the main ways that we can prevent hospital acquired infections and different kinds of infections. So that's also important in our PPE. Once Dr. Benz's hands are completely sanitized, and as you can see, she's quite thorough meeting that 15 to 20 second um, time limit. The next thing that she will do will be to put on her gown once her hands are dried. And Dr. Benz, I think, can get this on if she needs help. You can always have somebody get help to help you tie it in the back if you're having issues with that. And we will see if Dr. Benz needs any help. But right now, she's okay. got it going. And then she'll look and she'll get it tied around into the back. So once we get the once we get the uh, gown on, the next important thing to do is to put on our N95, and that is the really one of the most important steps because we're dealing with an airborne disease, an air transmission disease. So she looks to the right side. She's going to place one of the straps first over her head, and then she's going to get the second strap. Place it behind her ears, covering her nose. And then the really the important thing is to make sure you've got a good seal. So you want to do a couple deep breaths in and out to make sure that you're just like that. It's a perfect example of how she's done her seal test. So that's excellent. The next thing that can go on are her eye protection or her face shield. Absolutely perfectly done. And then finally, it's time to put on the gloves. And it's really important when you do put on the gloves. Now, our, our um, disposable gowns actually have thumb holes in them. So you can literally put the glove right over it. If you don't have these thumb holes, just go ahead and make sure that the glove covers the end of the gown. That's really important. You don't want a place for the materials to get in. As you can see, Dr. Benz is ready for action. She can go do whatever procedure she needs to do and do it safely. So this is how you don your PPE. The next step will be how you doff your PPE. So the first things we're going to do now is remove our gloves. And notice how she did that by grabbing that. Now she's gonna get her thumb or finger underneath the glove, wrap them together, and dispose of them in the trash. Very well done. The next step, what would you like to do next? We'll be taking off her headdress. There you go. And then comes off the N95. Make sure that you touch the straps only. Well done. We got one strap. Now we have the second strap coming off. Well done and into the trash. And finally, she's going to roll her gown down so as to make sure that she doesn't touch the outside after she's unhooked. And now she will roll her gown down. Right. And notice how she's rolling it so she doesn't touch any of the surface and then it goes into the trash. And finally, she's going to repeat the hand sanitizing component. So doffing and donning is something that we do between each and every patient. Right now, we are on um, regular use, and so we can change out N95s. If you want to use extended use, which we are doing at the hospital to a degree, that's still acceptable. So... Thank you for your time and attention. This was a great example. I also want to thank Dr. Benz for coming in and helping us demonstrate how to properly don and doff our PPE. Thanks so much for your time and attention and see you soon. Dr. Resnick, that was a great review of proper donning and doffing of personal protective equipment. I'd also like to thank Dr. Benz 
for your participation in this and your excellent example of how to do things. Um, first of all, um, we, we all are, of course, putting on protective equipment every day and taking it off. But you can see from this that the proper order and the proper technique is extremely important, again, to protect not only your patients, but to protect yourself. Our next speaker is Karen Gregory. Now, Karen is a registered nurse, and Karen is also the Director of Compliance and Education at Total Medical Compliance. And her presentation is going to be on the sterilization process, proper technique. And to me, this is something that is extremely important. And the reason is that when you stop and think about it, sterilization of instruments in an office it is a highly technical procedure. You've got to follow certain protocols. And without it, you're working on patients without sterile instruments. And at Compliance Training Partners, our team will tell you that we get calls almost every day with what we call sterilization disasters. Sterilization disaster, in my mind, that's when someone calls and says, we've worked on X number of patients with instruments that weren't sterile. Help, what do we do? So with that, Karen, I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Hi, my name is Karen Gregory, and I am so thrilled to be with you this evening. We are going to talk about the sterilization process, and hopefully you will see this as a key to successful dentistry. I work for a company called uh, Total Medical Compliance. I am their director of compliance and education, and, and you may be surprised to know that I'm actually a registered nurse. However, I have been involved in working with dental practices over the past 10 to 12 years, and I counted a privilege uh, to be asked by Henry Sean to share some information with you about the sterilization process. So we got some good news. Uh, COVID-19 has actually not impacted the process of um, preparing your instruments for reuse. So it is the one thing in your work area that it is remaining consistent. So I know that you are uh, glad to hear that, but I want you to sit back and I want you to just think a little bit about the value of that area in your workplace. Is it, or do you think of it as an investment? Uh, do you think of this as a risk reduction strategy? And uh, so maybe you're reading this slide here and it's, it's talking about mixing up packages that uh, were believed to have been placed in the autoclave. In fact, they were not. And then in fact, they were used on patients. So I don't know if that's ever happened in, in your work life, but I certainly have dealt with that on, on multiple occasions. So let me just throw out something to you. If you are not processing instruments correctly, it is entirely feasible that you could use a, an unsterilized instrument on a patient. And that takes you down this road of notification and testing and just anxiety for that patient. And it could actually impact the reputation of your practice. So think of this as a risk reduction strategy, but I want you to also think of it as an investment. Because if you don't have the instruments that you need in a timely manner, it's very difficult to take care of that line of, of, of patients. So the more patients that you can see, the more money that you can put on, on, on your bottom line, but you also wanna make sure that your patients are gonna be safe. So let's look at this process and step back and, and first look at what the CDC's recommendations are. So first of all, any instrument that's going in that patient's mouth, they should be cleaned and heat sterilized. So that's semi and, and, uh, and, and critical instruments. You also should allow those packages to dry on the sterilizer before you take them out. And so I think it's interesting that the CDC had to actually write that in their guidance. To me, they said that they were anticipating maybe a challenge uh, with that. And, and I will tell you, based on what I see, sometimes it is, a, it is tempting not to go in and pull those instruments out if you need them, even if they're wet. So there's uh, five different steps in this process. We're going to touch on them each briefly cleaning, packaging, sterilization and disinfection or disinfection, monitoring and, and storage. And so I want you to look at some of these images and, and realize that the instrument processing room is an area where you actually are at risk. So managing all of these sharp instruments there that aren't sterile it is a, a risk for a potential sharps injury to you. So proper PPE and proper transport of those instruments is, is very critical. 
You want to be transporting even a, even a cassette in a closed container that's appropriately labeled because as you can see on the bottom left hand corner, there is a tip of a sharp instrument sitting out uh, outside or poking through that cassette. And if it's not handled appropriately, it could drive a sharps injury, even in the sterilization area. So on the right hand bottom, as you'll see, there are some, some issues with that particular transport setup. One is that the cassette is not in a, a closed container, so it lends itself to the potential for the, the risk on the left-hand side, but also you don't have labeling on that transport container. Heavy-duty utility gloves should be used through the entire process from when you're breaking down that operatory to when you're putting those instruments in, um, in the sterilizer. So cleaning, if you don't have a clean instrument, it can't be sterilized or disinfected. So lots of options there. Well, actually two that I see frequently, the ultrasonic and, and the instrument washer. I understand that instrument washers, folks that have them would never go back. Those, those instruments come out dry and ready for packaging. Your, your uh, ultrasonic, I just wanna encourage you to make sure you're using those manu the manufacturer's directions that you're changing out uh, the solution when you need to and that you're always keeping the lid on, on the top of that unit while it is in use. Okay, so packaging is critically important. All of your instruments should be either wrapped or put in a sterilization pouch after they have been cleaned and thoroughly dried. The packaging material should be cleared through uh, the FDA. So for example, you're not gonna use brown paper uh, to wrap your instruments, so make sure you're also looking at those manufacturer's instructions on the appropriate use. So for instance, when we look at this blue wrap, it may be indicated by the manufacturer that you should actually use an inner and outer wrap if you're wrapping cassettes. So really important that you have those manufacturer's instructions in hand. It's also important, as you can see on the, the right-hand uh, picture, that you close the sterilization pouch by folding it on that perforated line so that you have a completely enclosed instrument. I could actually take and pour water in that little opening at the top of the package and it could go down inside, uh, inside that instrument pouch during storage or you might have a little mite that could uh, enter into that package. So be very, very careful and selective in your packaging. Then we get to the actual sterilization process. And if you look on the right hand side, this is Friday, Thursday or Friday at four o'clock and we're trying to get all of those instruments in that sterilizer so we can get everything done and, and out the door. But loading is extremely important. In fact, overloading of a sterilizer is the leading indication for a sterilization failure. So look at what your manufacturer outlines for you as it relates to proper loading of your sterilizer. Make sure that the packages are not touching the side of the chamber and make sure that you know whether or not you have clean or you have or sterile instruments in that sterilizer. I recommend actually putting a sign over it, either ready for sterilization or have been sterilized. That, that is a check and balance for not grabbing an instrument that may just have been put in there and has not already been sterilized and using that on the patient as we discussed earlier. So monitoring of the sterilization process is very critical and, and there's three different types of monitoring. I, I think of it maybe as a stool, a three-legged stool. One is actually monitoring the physical parameters, time, temperature, and pressure. And the other is the internal and the external indicators. And finally, your spore testing, which should be done at least on a weekly basis, is the gold standard actually to document that your autoclave is meeting those uh, desired parameters. So finally, and we've got a couple of slides here, but what are your thoughts when, when you see that? First of all, I go, wow, too many instruments in that package uh, for sure, but also somebody pulled that package out of the sterilizer before it was dry uh, and cool. In fact, I don't know that these instruments would have ever become dry, but a lot of things run through my mind. Um, do people understand the, the, the limits 
on using the, the sterilization pouches? Do they understand the parameters of uh, when a package is ready to come out? And if all of your packages are wet, then, then when the cycle is through, then I would ask you, have you overloaded that unit? Did you interrupt the cycle? Or is there something perhaps wrong with the actual drying element? So you wanna make sure you're storing the packages appropriately. Um, best case scenario is that you put like items together, uh, first in, first out, so that you're not having to, to dig through the drawers. As you can see on, on the right-hand side, uh, that is a drawer full of instruments. And when I went to close the drawer, I actually had an instrument wedge between the, the drawer front, front and the top of the counter. So appropriate storing ensures that that instrument it is another way to ensure that that instrument is safe for use when you get ready to sit down and deliver oral health care. Now, uh, as a final thought, a never event is something that you never want to have happen. And for me, in your scenario, uh, delivering oral health care, using an unsterilized instrument on a patient would be considered a never event. So think about the things that we have talked about, discuss it with your coworkers to make sure that everybody is on the same page because in most practices, everybody is involved with the sterilization practice, practices. And remember, all steps in instrument processing are equally important. Your patients will thank you. I'd like to thank you, Karen, for an extremely excellent presentation and, and a timely presentation, and one that, that I can tell you, you are preaching to the choir here because this is so important in my mind to not have a sterilization disaster. And for those of you that haven't had one, imagine right now, how would your patients react on social media or in, for that matter, personally, how would they react when you told them We've worked on you or your child or your family with instruments that weren't sterile. I wanna be certain too, to thank Henry Schein Dental for presenting this very timely, very important webinar on infection control. And our next speaker is really one of Henry Schein's own. This is Dr. Gary Severance, who's the executive leader of professional services at Henry Schein Dental. And what, Dr. Severance will be talking about will be air quality and air filtration as a means of breaking the chain of infection. And you know, this is something that's really been new to us in dentistry uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, thinking about things like air filtration devices, better filters on our furnace, uh, UV irradiation of the air. And so with that, I'm looking forward to Dr. Severance's presentation. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Gary Severance with Henry Schein Dental and it's my pleasure to take you through a quick tour of air uh, awareness of air purification for dental professionals. In the past year, we've certainly heard from all the different regulatory bodies and given them impressions and ideas and consultation on how dentistry should function and, and take care of infection control, certainly air purification. And most recently, uh, again, getting involved in this is ASHRAE, which is the air conditioning and refrigeration because we have air circulating through every portion of our office, or we should, and it exposes everybody that comes into our office uh, to any of the pollutants or, or contaminants that may be in the air, whether it's the front desk, the back office, even the janitorial crew walking through at night are probably affected by the air that's running through your office. And when we look at the infection control procedures that we do, we've had great content and dentistry has done a wonderful job of sterilization of the in instrumentation, surface contamination, disinfection, uh, PPE, certainly we're all, all aware of that. And then interoral aerosol management is key. But what about the extraoral aerosol management, the aerosol that escapes the mouth? We need to probably consider that a bit more. And there have been products developed specifically for that. And then certainly the overall air quality. Now, when we look at the transmission routes of diseases, they're essentially direct contact like a handshake, indirect contact called fomites, where you come in contact with doorknobs, doors. That's why we're disinfecting all of those areas as well. And then 
towards the mouth, you have the droplet uh, greater than five microns of the spray, uh, external spray, and airborne, everything that escapes or that circulates through the entire office. And the goal is to look at these chains of infection and break them. And in air purification, we break them by increasing the ventilation, having airflow directed and also constant. We filter the air, get out the pollutants, we distribute the air completely throughout the office, and we look at disinfection technologies. Now, when we hear that, we, we certainly paid a lot of attention to aerosol generating procedures most recently. And the fact is not only does dentistry create aerosol generating procedures with most of the things that we do in the chair, uh, it's, it's not a uh, black and white line because you come here and a sneeze is an aerosol generating procedure, talking loud, singing, everything we do essentially in a breath is aerosol generating procedures. And we've also been really accustomed now to looking at how long can viruses live on surfaces or in the air. And we've certainly got documentation that it varies. But if we can circulate the air, filter the air, and clean the air, we have a better process of uh, getting better um, decontamination of the air itself. And in the air, because it's airborne procedures, we're dealing with very fine and small particles, everything from a human hair, which could be 70 to 100 microns, all the way down to some of those viruses that are submicron, much submicron. And so filtering becomes very key there of how. Uh, small a particle, we can filter and get out of the air or keep them moving or have them settle. Now, the benefits of air purification and ventilation have been long well known, and it's better that we take consideration even more so now in the past. It does give you well-being and health of the whole team, whether it's in dentistry or any building. It increases productivity. It's been proven to decrease absenteeism. And if you have the air circulating and you're, you're mentioning it or showing it to your patients that you're circulating the air, whether it's in the aircraft or in your dental office, it gives you a better impression of who is taking care of you in the office. Now, the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, has always had three very consistent steps in controlling air pollutants. And these follow exactly what dentistry can look at. Source control, so where are we creating the aerosol? How do we control the source? Keeping then, once the source has been created, how do we ventilate it, get it out of the pathway of the patient or the dental professionals, and then how do we clean that air? So it makes very good sense to follow this when we look in dentistry. And we already have a great idea of what source control is. You've seen a great or will see a great presentation on the intraoral evacuation techniques, which are critical for handed dentistry, being able to capture that information, uh, the environment. Uh, the mist and the aerosol and get it out in, into a, a con, uh, entrapment. And then we can also look at extra oral just outside the mouth, all of the aerosols that do escape the mouth. We can use extra oral devices to suction that out away from our clinical field of uh, practice. And then we think about our rooms itself, the operatories or smaller areas or offices. And many have probably gone out and purchased consumer uh, level of ventilation and air purification systems for your home or for your office. And typically we make a decision based on stylish and silent. You know, we want them quiet and obtrusive, but we want them to look good. So you may go out to some of these stores and purchase one and put it in the corner of your operatory. That's all good. But I would stand to say that these are very good consumer units. But in a dental office, it's a little different than home. Number one, you're creating more generating procedures that create aerosol. And also you have more and more people bringing in new air and clearing the air between patients. So you may meet, need a little more aggressive systems. And they have those in dentistry for medicine and, and dentistry that allows you to either centrally filter or decontaminate the air or in each operatory, you can put these little devices that have multiple methods of decontaminating or purifying the air. And we'll go through a little bit of that. But suffice to say that the dental office is a little different than your home. And you may wanna look at the higher requirements and higher level of purification. Now these devices, whether it's through your HVAC system, or through uh, in-office or in-room purifiers work by either filtering the air and or inactivating the decontaminants or some chemical nature. I just want to go through a couple of the options that you have to look at. Filtration, it's the most common one, and you already have it if you have an 
HVAC system in your office, there is a filter that goes in there and it should be changed every month or when your HVAC technician recommends it or your system is recommending. And these are typically called MERV filters, minimum efficiency reporting value filters. And they can range anywhere from one to 20 in a range. The higher the rating, the smaller the particles they can capture essentially. And so when you look at this, one of the first things you could do is go to Lowe's or office or Home Depot, and look for these filters that you get them uh, and consider there's different ratings. And what you essentially wanna do is get the highest level filter that you can check right now and get the highest level filter that will still keep efficient airflow. If you get it too, too, too restrictive, the air is not gonna flow and you're not gonna get ventilation. So you may wanna check for you, with your system, what's the highest level of MER filter that can achieve efficient airflow, but then also up your filtering process or check with an HVAC tech of what the highest level and you can simply switch that immediately and get more efficient air uh, cleaning. A second one, these filters typically go in these standalone units or up into the HVAC system itself, and they are HEPA filters. And you may have heard of them for the first time. The CDC recommends them uh, in dentistry, high efficiency particulate air filters. Again, they have different ratings as well. They get 99.9% 99 .9 of the particles that are 0.3 microns larger and smaller. So it's interesting that the airflow will carry these particles through these glass fibers and actually uh, capture a lot of those filters. And if they capture more, they become even more efficient. The little dirty uh, filters actually capture more. But at some point, it becomes too contaminated or too clogged and the airflow doesn't. So you do need to replace them as well. And then another filter is called the carbon or charcoal filter. And these are for the odors, uh, the liquid contaminants, the volatile uh, organic compounds, and they can also be complementing HEPA or MERV filters in there. And then we get to inactivation, meaning how do we uh, decontaminate the air and kill viruses or, or not only filter them, but physically uh, damage them. And UVC light does that. It damages the RNA and DNA. Photocatalytic oxidation, combining the UV light with a titanium dioxide catalyst creates part, uh, particles or radicals that can burn these particles in the air and collide with them. And then simply creating ions, negative and positive ions. So the negative ions are heavier. They can grab onto these particles, which are typically positive ions and bring them to the ground, out of the breathing zone or to those content, the surfaces. And then many of the dental products that you may look at or filters combine these. So they not only have great filtering, but then they run them through these chemical inactivation processes. So you can get a more efficient in a single pass or recycling pass. You can make sure you not only filter, but inactivate those particles as well. And you can see they can be very efficient um, and, and very effective. And then for surface, uh, EPA list, uh, list N has an app that will tell you all the, ke the chemicals that will work on the SARS-CoV-2 virus as well. Uh, hypochlorous acid, quaternary ammonium have also been uh, recommended in some cases, not officially by some of the, the dental institutes, but have been used in fogging. If you're in an airline, you'll see them fog uh, the, the uh, cabin also with some of these chemicals. So, but the ultimate is something called negative pressure rooms. These are used in hospitals where you're forcing or sucking in very clean air uh, and then pushing the contaminated air out through filters. And this requires a closed room, which may not be effective or practical for many dental offices, but is something to consider in a, a high traffic area or an area where uh, aerosol generating procedures are going to be done. It continues a refreshment of clean air. So as you look at these, these can be standalone units or can be in the centralized uh, HVAC system. Uh, you can customize it so your patients know that you are uh, cleaning the air as well. And it can be in an operatory, they can be sitting on the floor. The one thing to consider is make sure you're pulling the air away from the breathing zone of the patient and the dental professionals. So bring it typically to the foot of the chair away from the operating field through this, the filters and through the areas. So consider airflow in your office and don't compete with your HVAC system. Make sure it complements. Uh, even an open window will help with the ventilation pulling out. 
You can also have these for small offices or the front desk. And when you start to look at what's right for your office, you can look at what type of filters you want to use, what type of decontamination. You can look at the airflow, how fast does that air clear out? You need to know the, the space that you're dealing with, how much air do you want to circulate? Air change rate or air change per hour can be calculated. Again, the CDC at one point said 15 minutes between patients but you can either uh, ensure that you're circulating the air and make that less as well. Sound level has to be comfortable for you and your patients. Most are lower uh, than what we hear with a handpiece and uh, the cost over time. Consider it if you're changing filters or changing some of the more expensive components with some of the higher end, so be aware of that. There's some great tools you can use to compare all the air purification systems for dentistry, as well as understand every office is unique. Uh, square footage of your operatory or your office, the design of it, is it open or closed rooms, the environment itself, patient flow by them running through these areas, you, they create their own flow. Team members running through the office front to back are creating flow as well and bringing air with them. And then how often are you creating these aerosol producing procedures or generating procedures that you need to take care of and be aware of? Infection control is a bundling and a layering. So don't, you just can't do one. You have to do surface decontamination. You have to use, you use P, PPE. Uh, you have to look and consider the air. So the more we can do, the more additive it is and safer for our practice. Thank you very much for taking this quick tour through the awareness of air purification for dental professionals. Dr. Severance, I'd like to thank you for that presentation. What I like most about it, it's, it's a very common sense approach to air quality and air management. Um, I especially enjoyed your part about how to properly uh, choose a filtration device or choose the right type of filter, uh, because this is all new to us in dentistry. That was typically uh, something that was done maybe in the hospital OR, but, but not in our facility. So thank you again for that excellent presentation. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Sammy Shahal. Dr. Shahal is a general dentist who's going to provide us with some important information about intraoral and extraoral evacuation as a way to keep our operatory safer. Particularly, it's a way to decrease aerosols. And I think that during this pandemic period, we've been more aware than ever of the importance of decreasing aerosols. With that, I'm looking forward to hearing your presentation on how we can practice more safely by decreasing aerosols. Hi everyone, my name is Sammy and I'm a restorative dentist located in Southern California and it's an absolute honor to present a lecture on infection control for Henry Schein. And the goal of today's lecture is going to be to review evacuation techniques and technologies that allow us to reduce the amount of aerosols in our dental operatories and in our dental office. I think this applies to dentists in particular, but also dental hygienists, dental assistants, anyone in the dental field, so that you know what's out there to keep you safe. And before we jump into our lecture, I just want to give you guys a little bit of intro about myself. So I work alongside my mother, who's been in practice for over 35 years. My wife is also a dentist, and we're currently in the process of building a practice that has eight operatories, that has enough space for us to all work in, that has natural light coming in, which is going to be definitely something new for our office. So if there's anyone out there that wants to get some insight about building a practice, um, be sure to let me know and we can talk about that. And also I do have a channel called Smile Influencers on TikTok and YouTube. I do dental educational videos on YouTube and on TikTok, it's more entertainment. Um, I think every dentist should have a YouTube channel because it's important that we educate our communities. And I think that's gonna be a great way to also get patients through the door um, in your practice. So what are we gonna be talking about today? Well, our first topic is gonna to be about aerosols in dentistry and how we generate aerosols in dentistry. And then we're gonna talk about different devices, intraoral evacuation devices and extraoral evacuation devices. I'm gonna be showing a lot of videos, so it's gonna be really engaging, and I hope that I can keep you guys entertained throughout the entire lecture. 
Um, so why are we talking about this today? Well, in case you guys were under a rock somewhere, of course, the coronavirus pandemic has been rampant, especially in um, 2020, and we're dealing with the ramifications now. It's caused dental offices to reevaluate their infection control uh, protocols, and it also has caused us to look into evacuation technologies. Now, talking about aerosols in dentistry is nothing new in dentistry. In fact, this article from 2004 entitled Aerosols and Splatter in Dentistry talks about how we can use high volume suction or high evacuation to reduce aerosols um, to protect us from tuberculosis, to protect us from SARS, remember when that was a thing? Um, so that was out there and this was all the way in 2004. And of course they discovered that, you know, in addition to standard barriers like gloves, masks, things like that, that we should be using pre-procedural pre -procedural mouth rinses as well as high volume evacuation um, in our offices. Another article entitled, A Clinical Study Measuring Dental Aerosols With and Without the High Volume Extraction Device. Once again, it's just looking at the high volume evacuation and seeing how dramatically that can reduce aerosols in dentistry, okay? So how do we generate aerosols? Well, there are three main ways we're generating aerosols. It's gonna be through the ultrasonic devices, rotary instruments, and the air water syringe. By ultrasonic, we're talking, of course, about things like the piezo, things like the cavitron, where as a hygienist, if you're working, you can see the plumes of air and water coming from the patient's mouth. And we want to try to reduce that. Uh, rotary devices, we're talking about dentists that are using the drill to do everyday dentistry, removing cavities, sectioning teeth um, that need to be surgically extracted, things like that. Once again, that generates a lot of aerosols in the dental operatory, and it's our responsibility to try to limit the aerosols. And then finally, the air water syringe, of course, when we're rinsing etchant off the tooth, when we're you know using the air water syringe to rinse someone's mouth out, things like that, that can also generate a lot of aerosols. So how do we limit it? Well, there are two main ways. There's gonna be intraoral evacuation technology and techniques, and there's gonna be extraoral evacuation technology. So let's look at into in, let's look at intraoral evacuation. Okay, so for intraoral evacuation, one of the easiest ways to reduce aerosols is by the application of the rubber dam. Rubber dam in dentistry is really powerful and maybe a little bit underutilized. It's of course really important because it allows for the strongest bonding possible to re reduce the amount of uh, water that contaminates our preparation surface before we do bonding protocols. But on top of that, it has this additional feature where it's protecting the patient's throat um, from the air and it's also protecting us just in case a patient is infected infected with viral particles or things like that. So the rubber dam is one of the most affordable, easiest means to protect your dental team, your dental operatories um, during this pressing time. Of course, there are other devices that are on the market. This is an example of a device that we use in our practice. It's called the PureVac HVE. And you can see that this device attaches to your high volume uh, evacuation. It has rounded edges, it has a mirror, uh, a lot of our hygienists are using this to help minimize the um, aerosols when they're using the Cavitron or they're using other ultrasonic devices. I do have a video here that kind of shows this in action. So as you can see, the rounded tips helps you retract the cheek, uh, it can help you retract the tongue as well. And the reason why we would use this rather than our standard um, suctioning tip is that it won't grab the tongue. Uh, it's a little bit easier on the patients, a little bit more comfortable. So that is something that's out there. Um, there's also another device that we have at our office. It's called the Ivory Relief. This is another way that um, I usually, one of my hygienists picks either this or the PureVac HVE. It attaches to the side of the cheek. It's really good at eliminating that plume of air and water that you see when you're using the piezo or, or other ultrasonic devices and it's really comfortable for our patients. And that's how it looks like in the mouth. Um, another powerful tool under the intraoral evacuation category is going to be the isolate. Isolite serves many purposes. Number one, it retracts the tongue, it retracts the cheek, 
and also it can has this nice illumination property that can illuminate the mouth. You can change the light source to an orange light just in case you're doing some bonding work and it's a really powerful device. In this video you see here you can see how brightly it illuminates the site. It's really powerful if you're limited on staff, if you're short staffed. Um, when you put this device in here you just put it in, you can start drilling, it's going to remove all that water and air. It's pretty comfortable for the patients as long as they can tolerate the bite block um, and it's another powerful tool to eliminate the amount of air and water that escapes from our patient's mouth. And then finally, there are some other options out there on the market. This is a product by Zerk that um, allows you to get that evacuation technology. It doesn't have that external light, but it is more affordable, and we have plenty of these that we go through um, every single day. Okay, so that's intraoral evacuation, and those are some of the products that I'm currently using at my office, but we also need to talk about extraoral evacuation. These are things that are outside of the mouth that help reduce the amount of aerosols in our operatories. So for extraoral evacuation, um, mainly we're talking about HEPA air filtration systems. And currently there are being research studies on these HEPA air filtration systems to see how effective they are at turning over the air and reducing the viral load in our small dental operatories. So there are still studies going on that are looking at the effectivity of these devices, but I just wanted to give you guys a brief review. When you look at these devices, you can go on Amazon and they have these little small air filtration devices, but you want to be extra careful because we want something that can filter a very small particle size. And there have been studies that have indicated that the coronavirus particle size can be as low as 0.06 to 0.14 microns. So we want that HEPA filtration technology to be able to filter as small a particle size as that in order to ensure that we're filtering as best as we can. Um, what we use at our office, we use something called the Jade Air Purifier. It does have this amazing HEPA filtration technology and it has other equipment and technology in there that helps filter the air. Um, and it's something that's really powerful and that um, we have in our operatories. They do have other technology out there. I'm sure you guys have seen this where they have a unit that's placed next to the patient with a robotic arm that has that high volume suction so that when you're drilling and working, it's removing that plume of air and water. Um, that's not something that I have currently, so I can't speak on it anecdotally, but I do have a lot of colleagues that have this device that use it and they feel more comfortable working um, with this device on hand. So just a few concluding thoughts before we end this brief lecture. Uh, number one is that there are plenty of affordable options out there. So just by simply using a rubber dam, you know, one of those latex-free rubber dams, those are very affordable devices. It does take a lot of time to get trained appropriately, to train your team and staff, and to implement it at your office. And it's not something that's very easy to do, but with the appropriate training, um, it's something that you can definitely implement and it's gonna be, it's gonna do wonders for your practice. Patient perception, um, anecdotally, I've had patients come into our office and literally ask us, well, what are we doing to keep them safe? And, you know, I feel more comfortable knowing that I have some extra oral evacuation technology, that we're using intra oral evacuation technology to limit the aerosols. And I think it's our responsibility as dental practitioners, dental providers, to do everything we can to keep our team and our patients safe. So the patient perception, um, by what I mean by that is that I think patients are becoming more aware that in dentistry, aerosols are generated and they wanna make sure that they're safe. And having this technology on hand is something that will allow you to confidently answer those patients' concerns. And then the final thing I wanna mention is protecting our team. You know, in dentistry, we are drilling and filling every day. We work very intimately and closely with our patients. So, you know, we're up in there. So we have to do everything we can to protect ourselves whether that's N95 mask, level three mask, whether that's protocols that keep patients waiting in their car before they come in, things like that are gonna be really helpful in limiting the amount of infections that can be contributed from your office. We obviously want that rate to be zero. So I think it's something that you guys should seriously consider, and I hope you gain something from this lecture that you can use in the future. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch me speak about evacuation techniques and technologies, and I will definitely see you for another lecture in another time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shahal, for this very practical presentation on how we can manage aerosols. Uh, one thing I really like is that you are a practicing general dentist and you give us some really good 
easy solutions on how we can decrease aerosols in the operatory and make the office safer for not only our staff, our patients, and for ourselves. Thank you again. Thank you for joining Henry Schein's Infection Control Awareness Month webinar. A special thank you to OSAP, the Organization for Safety, Asepsis, and Prevention, for their partnership, leadership, and commitment to ensuring we are providing you with the most updated and relevant information to keep both your practices and patients safe. In honor of September being Dental Infection Control Awareness Month, we wanted to share our latest flyer dedicated around infection control that includes great deals and promotions across our infection control products. I hope everyone enjoyed tonight's presentation. I especially want to thank Henry Schein for having the foresight for putting this together at the right time and for putting this excellent group of speakers together to help us. I'd like to thank the speakers themselves for your contributions to this presentation. Um, at Compliance Training Partners, we're all about safety and I really appreciate what everybody has done tonight to make the dental office safer for staff, patients, for ourselves, and to improve the quality of care that we deliver. Thank you, and good night, everyone.